for the first time in a while, we get to add a few new antimicrobials to the list. We left off with cell wall inhibitors, cell synthesis inhibitors, and protein inhibitors. These classes act on bacterial structures to prevent them from synthesizing needed materials or to kill them off right away. For the last grouping, the antimicrobacterial agents are a mixture of several classes. The abbreviation RIPE is used to remember the four main antibiotics used to fight tuberculosis and other difficult mycobacterial infections. The R in this mnemonic is for rifampin, which is part of the rifamycin drug classes, along with the other similar sounding drugs, rifaximin, rifampicin, etc. This antibiotic blocks the creation of new bacterial genetic information, specifically the beta subunit of RNA polymerase, preventing the creation of RNA. Since a bacteria can no longer make new materials, it stalls out. The rifamycins are derived from a species of Streptococcus. Remember those bacteriosins we discussed in a few previous modules? Well, since the bacteria try to kill each other, we might as well use their natural weapons against them as well. Many antibiotics are synthesized from bacterial products. With INH, it specifically inhibits the mycolic acids unique to mycobacterial cell walls and that make them stain positive with acid fast stain. Isoniazid is a drug of its own class, specifically targeting the CAT-G gene that regulates catalase peroxidase. Don't worry, the gene and enzyme associations are fairly low yield, but for the gunners out there, it won't hurt you to write these down. Next in the mnemonic is the P for pyrazinamide. This is an acid and it acts to decrease the pH within the bacteria. Disrupting pH of any cell can cause dysregulation within the cell and, at high enough quantities, death of the cell. In mycobacteria, we know that the decrease in pH helps to stop fatty acid synthesis, which is used in the cell walls of the bug. And lastly for the ripe mnemonic is ethambutol. This antimycobacterial also acts on a group of enzymes used for cell wall synthesis. The arabinosyl transferases are inhibited by this drug, causing prevention of further production. Altogether, the specifics detailed here are fairly uncommon for medical students. Just be thankful that you're not a pharmacist or a biochemist at this point. What is important is that you know the name, the basic mechanism of action of each, the treatment length, and the side effects, which we'll discuss at the end of this video. Streptomycin and dapsone also fall into the antimycobacterials. Streptomycin is an aminoglycoside, but is only used in multidrug resistant TB for this family. Dapsone is really only seen used in conjunction with rifampin and clofazamine for the treatment of leprosy. All right, now that was a bit of new information and the enzyme names can sound like a whole other language. Well, biochemistry and pharmacology really do have their own language. Let's take a brief moment to review here. Rifampin blocks nuclear material synthesis, specifically inhibiting RNA polymerase. INH and ethambutol block the cell wall, each working on different enzymes. Pyrazinamide decreases fatty acid synthesis by creating a more acidic intracellular environment. Primarily, active TB is treated with the entire RIPE drug regimen due to the high resistance levels. There's a simple mnemonic to remember the treatment length of TB. 4 for 2 and 2 for 4. This means use all four drugs for two months, and then two, usually INH and rifampin, for the remaining four months. If we're concerned about latent TB, such as that that doesn't show up on a chest x-ray, INH and rifampin are used once a week for 12 weeks, called the 3HP program. This is less testable than active TB questions, but important as you are likely to run into at least one TB case in your career. Some fairly random sounding points, but definitely fair questions, involve co-infections or use of other drugs. In particular, a fact you should probably be aware of are the use of tumor necrosis factor inhibitors or co-infections with HIV AIDS. TNF inhibitors decrease the immune system. If someone were to have latent TB, their macrocytes are probably still holding back the lipid-filled granulomas discussed earlier. If you now knock that defense away, the TB would be allowed to spread without checkpoints. Make sure to check for TB before starting this medication class. As for co-infections, HIV is a large part of why TB has made a resurgence in developed nations. By decreasing the immune system, HIV leaves those infected with very little protection from the microbe that is in our soil, water, and all around us. It is important to stay healthy in order to prevent numerous disease processes 
including infection with TB. For HIV, patients specifically, a CD4 count of less than 100 is an indication for prophylaxis from this microbe. A macrolide, like azithro, is appropriate for the disease. Finally, to move on to the non-tuberculous grouping. And to finish off the last few quickly, we first have leprosy. As discussed above, it is relatively straightforward. The trifecta of dapsone, rifampin, and clofazamine is recommended. Dapsone can be used for prophylaxis as well, though the situation for this need is rare. Though MAC are similar in presentation to TB, and can be found in nearly any water source imaginable, they have not yet developed the resistance that TB has. More accurately, it has resistance to several antimycobacterials, but is usually still sensitive to other antibiotic classes. There doesn't seem to be a clear direction from the CDC or IDSA, but a general agreement is that at least two drugs should be used. Often, a macrolide, like amikacin, and clarithromycin are mentioned or azithromycin, rifampin, and ethambutol have been recommended in the past. The treatment can differ depending on the severity of disease, but that is beyond the scope of this course. And obviously, if the CDC and IDSA can't make general recommendations, it's pretty hard for them to test on it. Similar combinations have been provided for other NTM species. Many are quite rare, so there has not been strong evidence to support these regimens. But in all honesty, you're almost never going to see a question regarding these during your medical school career. Clinically, rare diseases like these will quite frequently call for an infectious disease specialist to get the most up-to-date information and guidelines. And now to end this module, let's look at some of the most important contraindications for each antibiotic class. There are dozens of potential interactions for each antibiotic, but the same can be true for aspirin, and that doesn't stop people from swallowing handfuls at a time. In fact, some medications people refuse to take due to fear of side effects have less contraindications than simple aspirin. But we won't delve too much into the pharmacal conspiracies in this video. We'll only go over the most severe ones for right now. Any greater depth will likely be covered in pharmacology. For the beta-lactams and other cell synthesis inhibitors, the first thing that should come to mind is allergic reaction. A penicillin allergy is a favorite topic for exam writers and can be life-threatening if your patient goes into anaphylaxis. However, most people that claim to have these allergies don't or only have mild allergy. There is a slight cross-reactivity amongst penicillin allergies and other beta-lactam. Old data used to report that this was anywhere from 10 to 30% cross-reactivity, but more recent studies show it to be closer to around 2% point is, if you can, give the patient with an allergy a non-beta-lactam. If you have to give them a cephalosporin or other drug due to the limited bacterial sensitivities, then just do it. Just keep them in the clinic or hospital for about 30 minutes afterwards to monitor for anaphylaxis. It's better they have a reaction where they're safe in the clinical setting than at home. For vancomycin, monitor for red man syndrome, ototoxicity, and nephrotoxicity. In red man syndrome, the skin turns red rapidly and can be a startling presentation. However, you can maintain the patient on the drug and just titrate the dose down. For the cell synthesis inhibitors, we need to be concerned with a variety of things. For sulfonamides, drugs with a sulfa molecule can be an allergen as well. If a patient is allergic to any drug with a sulfa in it, which there are many classes with this element in it, they should not take any other sulfa-containing drug. This includes TMPSMX. Fluoroquinolones were a favorite for many years. However, in the last few years, many physicians have turned away from them due, in part, to the severe side effects of tendinitis and tendon rupture. Many no longer recommend ciprofloxacin for UTIs as a primary treatment as well, so you may want to make note of this in our past UTI microbes. They are also teratogenic, so don't use these in pregnancy. Let's now take each protein synthesis inhibitor class one at a time. Tetracyclines can cause many potential issues, but the most important are those to pediatric patients and the potential for permanent hearing loss. Ototoxicity, though not very common, can be permanent. It is often not worth the increased morbidity to the patient to use this when something else will suffice. We also spoke about not using doxycycline in patients under 10 years old in the SpireKids module. These are considered teratogenic in pregnancy and can cause teeth discoloration in pediatrics. As these are not really first line to many infections, except for those involving ticks, this is usually not a big concern. Aminoglycosides are also ototoxic. 
This seems to be a common theme for antibiotics. However, the occurrences are much more commonly associated with tetracyclines. There is also a concern for nephrotoxicity and neurotoxicity with aminoglycosides. All in all, these are pretty uncommon. Macrolides are best, or worst, known for their GI upset. In fact, erythromycin is commonly used to help patients with constipation issues. That's one way to turn a negative into a positive. There are many drug-specific concerns for each antibiotic in each group as well, but let's just get the starting points down for now. You can always add on to the main points later on. Chloramphenicol is best known for gray baby syndrome. However, due to its rarity, the bone marrow suppression is probably more relevant to most physicians. Just don't give this to a mother. In fact, don't give any antibiotics to a mother without further research and completing a risk-benefit ratio. Linezolid is a great drug to cover MRSA, but also risks bone marrow suppression. This is another common side effect seen in many medication classes, not just antibiotics. Of course, it takes an entire pharmacology course to cover all of the details for each specific drug within each class. This is simply a broad overview to form a foundation. And lastly for this module, the right drugs have their own side effects to be concerned about. In general, they all have the ability to cause hepatitis. Specifically, with rifampin, it is most known to turn the patient's urine red-orange. This can be a very disconcerting side effect if you don't warn them about this ahead of time. Isoniazid is probably best known for peripheral neuropathy. The patient may get pins and needles feeling in their extremities, or may be more severe. This is due to the decrease in vitamin B6 INH causes. Luckily, this can be prevented or treated with supplementing B6. Pyrazinamide can cause hyperuricemia and arthralgia in several locations. The hyperuricemia can go unnoticed until the patient develops gout. And lastly, ethambutol. Don't look at this one too long. It'll mess with your eyes. No, really. It can lead to strange red-green blindness in patients. This is usually dose-dependent, so decreasing the dose may still make it feasible if needed. Well, I don't know about you, but I've had enough of pharmacology for the day. It's a great time to take a break and maybe review before the next module. If you have any subscriptions or QBanks, it might be a good time to try some out. USMLE QBanks usually do not separate bacteriology from other microsections, and will often be more of infectious disease topics but it wouldn't hurt you to get an idea of what to expect if you plan on taking the USMLE exam. More appropriate questions at this point can often be found at the end of chapter sections for some microbiology textbooks or certain online resources. Check the Free Med Ed Micro and Resources page as we occasionally update them with new resources.